That's good. That's good. If you have your Bible, and I hope you have, because uh, the Jew has been called the people of the book, and Christians are people of the book. And so we have a book that is God's infallible Word, right. Holy Bible. If you'd like to stand with me this morning now as we read the Scripture. In John chapter number 3 and verse 1. John, Genesis, Genesis 3, 1. Sorry. <laughs> my mouth goes one way, my mind goes another. Amen. I'd like to get them to meet somewhere. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 1. The Scripture says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That is arrogance like you've never heard it. Amen. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The book of Genesis, folks, is the book of beginnings. Book of beginnings. In the Hebrew Bible, it is Bereshith. It simply means in the beginning. It's the book of beginnings about the history of mankind, beginnings about God's relationship with man, beginnings as it relates to salvation and redemption, beginning of sin. And here we read in the book of Genesis chapter number 3 of the fall of man. Mankind fell from the position that God had placed him. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 2, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him? God made man in his own image, not an angel, not a cherubim, not a seraphim. The reason I keep reminding you of this is because man is unique and distinct from every other creature that ever has lived or drawn a breath of life on the face of this earth. We are different. And the Bible says plainly that man will have one day all things put in subjection under his feet. In the book of Genesis, we find where God had placed his creation under the feet of Adam and made him the king of the world and given him dominion and power and authority to name the beast and everything on this earth. And Adam, therefore, had received all this from God. But the Bible teaches us plainly that Adam fell. And when he fell, he fell from that position of authority and responsibility upon this earth. But the fall of Adam meant far more than simply giving up authority and a domain. It had to do with his very essence. It had to do with what he was. It had to do with his relationship with the Lord. And it had to do with the future of all mankind from that moment forward. For what Adam did in Genesis chapter number 3 affects you directly. You are benefiting, if you want to call it that. You are suffering, which is the best word to use, because of what Adam did in Genesis chapter number 3. The Bible says plainly in the book of 1 Timothy that Eve was deceived, was in the transgression. But Adam walked into it with his eyes wide open. That, of course, is a different message for a different time. But it tells us that what goes on inside the human heart is not easy to be understood. But in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 21, we read, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothes them. 
For when Adam's rebellion brought a fall upon mankind, the grace of God brought salvation when he brought the coats of skin. God never reacts to anything. Known unto God are all of his works from the foundation of the world. In Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 8, they begin to realize the consequences of their sin. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And so now we have Adam and Eve that have fallen from the presence of the Lord, and because of that fall, a murderer, murder has entered in to the heart of mankind. It was only, I suppose, in the mind and soul of Eve when she looked at the body of her dead son Abel and realized for the first time in her life the real consequences of sin. For she was seeing sin in all of its glory. For when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. And my friends, she had to deal with that issue of death. It now... <coughs> was upon mankind for all the rest of his days upon the face of this earth. Here lay her son, Abel. And my friend, I don't know if you've ever buried one of your children, but I don't know of anything that could happen to a mother or a father on this earth than to bury one of their children. I've been to that graveyard. I've been there many times when it was the casket of a son or a daughter that we carried out into that field. And my friend, there's no hurt like that hurt. There's no pain like that pain. And in the heart of Eve that brought Abel into the world and was his mother, Mother. Now she has to bury his dead body. And so we reap the wages of sin, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. In the book of Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number 15, the Bible said, The Lord said to him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, that any finding him should, kill, should not kill him, should kill him. In plain words, he had marked Cain out of his grace to give Cain a protection so that they knew that God had marked him and he was to be left alone. In the book of Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 24, we see as it, it progresses. In Genesis 5, 24, the Bible said, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. In the book of Genesis chapter 5, God is going to preserve the truth to pass down to generation to generation. I am so thankful unto God that I don't have my friend, the wisdom of this world, pop psychology and pop culture to tell me what's right and what's wrong and how I should think and relate to God. I've got his word. And you can be certain of this, that God intended from day one that his word would be preserved. And he preserved his word and you can see it already in the book of Genesis as he calls apart a certain line of people and to them he begins to give prophecy and you can tell it by the way they name their children. In Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 26 Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. The name Methuselah in Hebrew means when he is dead it will be sent. The it is in reference to the flood. It's going to come to an end. And so my friend, before Noah was ever born, God was telling the, ch the line right here, this line of people, there is going to come an end to this earth as you know it. And Methuselah's death will be the day that it comes. Well, that will usher in God's judgment on the earth. So God preserved the truth. In Genesis chapter number six and verse number two, the Bible said the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. They took them wives of all which they chose. God is going to preserve mankind now. Not only does he preserve the truth, but he will preserve mankind. But he chooses who is to pass over. For in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 10, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. It sounds like 2014 to me. 
But God is going to preserve mankind. He's going to call asunder a certain people to carry over from the old world into the new. So now he has seen to it that truth is preserved. And now he is going to preserve a certain group of people. And they were Noah and his family. And the scripture teaches us that it was eight souls that were carried from the old world into the new. In Genesis chapter number 6 and verses 10 through 14, the Lord of the earth was corrupt. And then God said in verse 14, make an ark of gopher wood, rooms and so forth. And he tells them exactly how it is to be made, the dimensions and what it will look like. And so Noah was obedient unto God. And the New Testament said to the saving of his house. And so eight souls move from the old world into the new world. The number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. The gematria of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is eight. Eight, eight, new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Everything about the Son of God makes new for mankind. He is new, and he's a new world for those who know him. So God now has preserved mankind. He has carried him through the flood. Then in Genesis chapter number 8 and verse 21, there is a new world. And we've only covered eight chapters of the book of Genesis. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. So the new world, my friend, unfolds before Noah. Here is an old world passed away, a brand new world before his eyes. All we have is Shem. Ham and Japheth to repopulate, replenish all of mankind. It is by the directive hand of God that man has been spared. Those that breathe are still breathing and walking on the face of the earth. But most of them have died and they've died because of the judgment of God. But in Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 13, he said, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Every time it rains in the sun or the sun or the right conditions and you see that rainbow in the sky, it reminds you that God will never again destroy this earth with rain and water as he did there in the book of Genesis. It is God binding himself to a covenant and he will not break his word. He is a faithful God, and it is impossible for God to break his word. So now man has been created fallen, and God has preserved his word. He's preserved mankind. He's brought them over from the old world into the new. And he has established it in covenant with a covenant relationship, not with man, but with the earth. And so from now on, that rainbow will shine, that red and that yellow and that blue, the primary colors that come forth from God alone own beauty that is indescribable when you look into the heavens and see a rainbow in the sky you say my what a wonderful thing that is beautiful beyond words and it came forth from the from the spoken word of almighty God my friend it is this if you ever know anything about God if you ever learn anything about his being if you ever understand anything about salvation and about your true nature about what makes you tick and about what What's inside your soul? It'll come by revelation. In revelation means it'll come from God. God must reveal himself for you to know him and to know who he is. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter number three that Adam died. Spiritual death came upon Adam and Eve. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. In Genesis chapter number four, we find the death of a son. We find death as it begins to manifest itself in the race of mankind. In Genesis chapter number 6 and chapter number 7, we find the de death of an entire generation. All flesh was wiped off from the face of the earth, save eight souls. In Genesis chapter number 9, we find the death of Ham. In plainer words, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He will be. My friend, these roads lead to death. These are the roads of unbelief and the roads of our culture that we live in today. Everything, my friend, that leads away from God 
leads to death. What comes forth from him is life and life everlasting. Light abides above and darkness and death from beneath. When you search about you and look to see what you find around you, you will find death. The thought of death, the life of death, those that lead to death. It's all about death. Man is fixated with death and there is no life apart from the life giver, the Lord God Almighty. But the only way you'll ever know that life is for God to reveal that life to you. You'll never know him till he reveals himself to you. You'll never understand what you really are till he begins to speak into your soul. There's a mystery with God. There's a mystery with you. There's a mystery with the Bible. There's a mystery with salvation. There are things that human intellect cannot breach. There are things about God you'll never understand till he makes them known to you. So what I say to you this morning is simply this. Listen to the voice of the Almighty as he speaks to you from his holy word. Death, my friend. We live in a culture of death. We live in a culture of sexual perversion. We live in a culture of sexual promiscuity. We live in a culture of drug addiction. Young people are dying all around us from drug addiction. Dying, dying here, dying there. They're burying them in their 20s and their 30s and in their 40s. They are dying. Do you know an old drug addict? Have you ever met one? Do you know an old drug addict in their 80s or their 90s? You don't know any. No. You don't know them. And the reason you don't know them is because drugs have taken them away before they ever reach that age. Listen, kids, leave drugs alone. They'll kill you. It's not your friend. And anybody that'll put a dope to your mouth or give it to you is your enemy. Drugs will kill you. Amen. Everybody thinks that they're that they are exempt. They think they're they think they're stronger. They think, well, I'm different. I can handle it. No, you can't. Amen. Drugs will kill you. Do you know what premarital sex will do to you, young ladies? Do you know what promiscuity will do to you? Do you know the cancers that are associated with this? This uh, terminology, this euphemism they use today. They call it sexual. Uh, they call it uh, sexual activity. They call them sex active. We used to call it promiscuity. When was the last time you heard the word promiscuity? You haven't heard it from CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, Fox, Look, Life, or any of the rest of them. You never will hear it unless it comes from the mouth of a debater on their show. Why? Because it is verboten. They don't use it. They don't use it anymore. Why? Because it's a judgmental term. It's a scriptural term. Promiscuity, promiscuous, free love, free sex, immoral, bed hopping, and you're paying a dear price. Some of you young young ladies in this church this morning will have to deal with cervical cancer. You'll have to deal with it. The HPV virus is transmitted and all, because there's over a hundred different HPV viruses and they produce cancer. They'll kill you. Do you realize that when God Almighty puts up a fence, and he puts up a gate and he warns you he's trying to keep you from death. There's only one that loves you and it's the Lord God Almighty. Play if you please but you'll pay the piper. Go ahead and dance but it's going to cost you dearly. Have you ever been in the HIV ward? Have you ever watched anybody die with AIDS? Have you ever seen what ravages it does to the body? Have you ever really seen what sin can do to a human being? And my friend, there's only one that can break the power of sin. Just one, just one, just one. Death entered in because of sin. Man's rebellion against God brought sin and death by sin. You realize, of course, that the death rate is 100%. You realize that? You say, preacher, are you telling me I'm going to die one day? Your body will die? As sure as you hear me right now, you will die. 
You've made preparation for your new home. You've made preparation for your job. You've made preparation for your bank account. You've made preparation for your girlfriend or boyfriend. But you haven't made any preparation for death. And that is the most certain thing in this world. For you might not have a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend. You might lose your home. You might lose your bank account. You might lose everything you've got. But you will not lose that certainty that you will die. The Bible said it's appointed to men once to die. Once to die. And then the judgment. In Luke chapter number 16, the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Who said that preacher? I need to talk to them. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who talked about the rich man in hell that died and lifted up his eyes in hell. There's only one, my friend, that can stop it in your life. He can stop the ravages of death in your life. He can turn your spiritual condition around. He can heal the brokenhearted. He can bind up the wounds. He can lift you up higher than you ever thought you could ever be lifted. He can forgive you and cleanse you. He can change your life. He can take you off the road to hell and put you on the road to heaven. He can write your name in the Lamb's book of life. There's just one, my friend, that can do that and his name is Jesus. That's the one. That's the name. That's the most blessed name that a person will ever hear on the face of this earth is the name of Jesus. You can say it a lot of different ways, but it all means the same thing. Jesus is Savior. He's my Savior, my Lord, and my God. I talk to him every day that I I breathe in this world. If I go a day and don't talk to him, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got to talk to him. I've got to talk to him. I've got to get alone with him. I've got to shut the door. Ah, hallelujah. I've got to get down. I've got to talk to Jesus. Let me give you a few things here this morning and I'll come to a close. There are many who talk a lot about him about his teachings. They, they put great emphasis upon meticulously breaking down everything that he said. Oh, they become scholars all about what he said. My, he said this. He said that. He taught this. He taught that. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to follow this teaching. We need to pay heed to this and this and this and this and this. But my friend, it is far more important, far more important that you have him. Instead of your emphasis upon what he said, it should be about who he is. It is him that saves the soul. He that hath the son, not the son's teachings. No, 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 certainly not the church's catechism. No, 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 no. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son hath not life. That's the mystery of salvation. It is that mystery of the human heart embracing the Lord Jesus Christ. It's taking hold of one you can't see. You can't touch him with your hand. But your soul longs for him. There's something deep down inside you right now that's crying out for help. But you're too much of a man. You're too much of a woman. You're too proud to let anybody know. But you've got doubts inside you. You've got fears in your soul. There are things in there that you need to lift it. There's a burden of sin that needs to be taken away. And there's only one name that can do it. And your heart is the only way you'll ever believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your mind mind can only go as far as a mind can go. But hear me well, your heart can reach into eternity. Your heart can carry you into the very presence of God. Your heart can go behind walls that nothing else can. Your heart can penetrate the very heart of God. God's heart and your heart are on the same wavelength. When you start talking from your heart, God starts listening. With a heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Hallelujah to God. Amen. And with a mouth, confession is made into salvation. Have you ever talked to God from your heart? There's a salvation of the soul and it doesn't come from intellectual assent. It doesn't come agreeing with the teachings of Jesus. It comes with the Son of God. Do you know who I'm talking about today? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. But few talk about Jesus. 
Phew! Listen to them next time they get up. Listen to these guys today as they get up and spin their denomination and spin their catechism and spin whatever they've got fixed in their head. But listen carefully. How much do they really talk about the Lord Jesus Christ? How much glorifying the Son do you hear out of them? How much do you hear coming forth from their heart? Praise and adoration. How much comes from the depths of their soul that says, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus. I'd be in hell if it wasn't for Jesus. I'm no good without Jesus. He saved my soul. He forgave my sin. He wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. It's about Jesus and not about me. When's the last time you heard that? You hear about how great men are. You hear about their accomplishments. And you hear about this catechism. I guess a sick of catechisms. 2,000 years of developing your catechism. Your catechism won't save you. But Jesus will. Amen. Amen. The mystery of salvation. What is the mystery of salvation? Well, preacher, you pray the sinner's prayer. And it's one, two, three, believe after me and everything's going to be okay. I know. And that's what's killed the Baptist church. And a lot of others. It's the idea you can get on an elevator with six young ladies and the third floor up, you got them all saved. You say, that's a joke. I know it's a joke, but some of them say it's happened. That's a joke. I want to make it plain. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. Some of you have prayed the sinner's prayer one, two, three, four, five. Some of you have been in church five, 10, 15, 20 years. Some of you have given up on God a long time ago because you've been listening to what man said to you. You've tried everything man says to try and then man wants to reassure you that it's okay. Why? Because of his own pride. That's why. If he told you what to do and you do it, then his own pride, his ego will say, you're okay now. No, you're not. You're okay when the mystery of God begins to blossom in your soul. When the Son of God comes alive in your heart. When you know that you know that you know you're not what you used to be. You know somebody's alive in you that wasn't there before. You know His Word sets your soul on fire. You know that you know that you know. And man cannot give that to you. That comes only from God. What is that? That's revelation. That's God revealing to you His essence, His power, His might, and His being into a creature. That's what I am. Regardless of how high God ever raises me one day, and I have some ideas in my mind how high that'll be. He came from there to where we are so that we can go from where we are to where He is. But in order for us to go from where we are to where He is, we've got to be prepared. Amen. There's some heavy duty work that's got to take place on you before you can ever be brought into the presence of that eternal, almighty, absolute being. How many agree with that? <laughs> but there's one thing for certain. He that hath begun a good work in you, and that work was salvation. And the Lord Jesus died at the cross and you were born again, born from above, born of God. The new birth, you were born of God. That, my friend, is final and eternal. Think about it. Your name was written down in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing can take it out of there. I am a Baptist when it comes to that. I believe, my friend, if you are born again, you're going to be born again a thousand years from now, a million years from now, ten million years, and nothing's going to change that. But that's just the beginning of the mystery of your relationship with God. Oh, what a God we serve. So many of my hang-ups and my handicaps and so many of the things that have led me astray and messed me up in my thinking have been when I listen to men. I listen to men. Quit listening to men and read the Word. And if you've got doubts in your heart and it floods your soul and you're not certain today, don't let your pride hold you back. Say, Lord God, here I am, I'm a creature, I'm lost, I'm a sinner, I need help, no argument, no defense, no hiding behind anybody, no hypocrites between us and you, between me and you, Lord God, here I am, it's just me and you. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, let me tell you something. God in his character, in his might, God in his essence, in his being, when you call upon him in his character, when you cast yourself at his feet, when you come and take hold of the mercy, the mercy of Almighty God, God, he's generous and gracious to reach forth and give you that that you call upon. He's a merciful, gracious God. 
And my friend, the mystery of salvation is a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing. I heard a preacher get up in the pulpit not too long ago, and he was making fun of the, of the, of the these were, I, I watched them on, t, on, on the internet one time as Greek Orthodox. You got Armenian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox. You got uh, you got uh, 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 all kinds of Orthodox that date back. Russian Orthodox. They back they they date back to the first century after Christ. Is everything the Orthodox Church teaches right? Well, it's the doctrines of men. But are there saved people in there? Yes, sir. Put that down. Yes, sir. There are. No doubt about it. I believe there are saved people in the Baptist Church. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. But oh, what an arrogant, boastful, smiteful thing to say. Well, they were just moving from this to that, moving from here to here, and moving over here, and they were before this, and they were doing this, and they were doing that, and they were doing this and doing that. Folks, that's a man that can't see past the end of his nose. I'm not interested in their liturgy. I'm not concerned about every little candle they light and every little icon they got hanging on the wall. Listen, we got the same stuff in here. I'm interested in what's in their heart. Do they have Jesus or not? He's no respecter of persons. Do you know him? The mystery of salvation is the person of Christ. And in 1973, when I bowed my head, I didn't know anything about a Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox any of the rest of the Orthodox Church. You didn't know anything about a Roman Catholic, except I used to go get drunk when I was in Okinawa with my Catholic buddies. Man, we'd get drunk, we'd stagger around on Saturday night, and then Sunday morning, I'd get up and go to Mass with them. They wanted me to go to Mass. Go to Mass with me, go to Mass with me. Okay, I'll go to Mass with you. So we went through the front door, and he reached over there and got some water, some sprinkled it on himself, and he said, now here, you do the same. So I got me some water, and I sprinkled it on me. We went on in there and we sat down. Where we sat down, they had a, they had a pew, and then they had a thing beneath it where you could put your knee. And the priest would get up and we'd stand up. Then he'd sit down, we'd sit down. Then we'd get back up and then we'd sit back down. I just followed my buddy. I didn't know what he was doing, didn't know what it was all about, but we'd be up and we'd be down. We'd be up and we'd be down. Up and down, up and down. I went to Mass a number of times. I'd go into the Mass and I'd sit around there and look around, look at all the stuff they got in there and this and that. Didn't do a thing for me. I'd go back out and we'd go back out and get drunk again Saturday night. Go out there and bring each other back to the base. Falling down drunk. I'd pick him up, he'd pick me up. We made, we wouldn't leave, we wouldn't leave each other drunk in the street. We made sure we got us all back to the barracks. On and on and on it went. Didn't do one thing to save my soul. He was a good buddy. He was a good buddy. But it didn't stop him from getting drunk. All this and this and up and down, up and down, up and down. If that's what you want to do, have a good time. But that has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Do you have the sun in your heart? Once the sun comes into your heart, you're drunken out there on Saturday night, falling down drunk. That's going to stop. It'll cease. You're going to change. And your friends are not going to be your friends anymore. You're going to have new friends. Everything's going to change. And that's just the way it is. Amen. And amen. Father, in Jesus' name.